Last surgery, we used the vital science monitor to better understand blood pressure, which is the mechanical result of the blood pumping through the body. Today, we're going to take a further look at the cardiac system using the electrocardiogram, also called EKG or ECG, to understand how that heart is pumping. When we use a stethoscope to listen to the heart, we get to hear the heartbeat. But when we use an electrocardiogram, we can actually see how the electrical current is causing the heart to beat and better assess the anatomy. And that's what we're going to focus on today. I'm Dr. Manx, and this is Everyday Vet. We're doing a mass removal on a dog because she has a mass under her upper left eyelid that is rubbing against her cornea. She is laying on her right side with her nose to my left and her tail to my right. With the drape in place, only the left eye is exposed. She's otherwise healthy, and I'm expecting her to do well under anesthesia. So now let's take a look at the vital signs monitor, also known as the multi-parameter monitor. As a quick refresher of the multi-parameter monitor, the red numbers in the lower left are the blood pressure readings. The large green number is the heart rate, and the line to the left of the heart rate number is the EKG reading. The small green number in the top right corner is the temperature probe, which is currently reading the room temperature because I'm using an actual thermometer on the patient instead. The yellow number is related to the breathing, but since this patient is on a ventilator, we'll not be needing that measurement today. Also, I do have an assistant in the room with me today who is planning on going to veterinary school, so you'll hear me explain some things to her throughout the procedure. By placing this clamp on it, I can prevent, I can like, it's got a backstop, so I can avoid accidentally like, endangering the, the actual eye, uh -huh. but it also clamps down, so I'm not gonna get as much bleeding when I do my cut. It's a handy dandy tool. <laughs> His eyelids tend to bleed like crazy. So this one, I mean, the mass keeps opening up and becoming ulcerated and it's already doing that for me, just clamping it. So definitely gonna be a good one to get off. As I just mentioned, eyelid mass removals can be quite bloody. If you remember from the last episode, blood pressure tends to drop with high blood loss. So we'll be keeping an eye out for that. But her blood pressure is actually starting out pretty good. So as promised, let's now learn more about the EKG. I tend to use the term EKG, but some people do use ECG instead. It doesn't really matter which term you use, um, but both are actually an abbreviation for electrocardiogram, which is a measure of the electrical signal that passes through the heart as it beats. The heart has its own electrical system that causes the muscles of the heart to contract in order to pump blood. I don't want to get too lost in the deep details of that just yet, so for now, you just need to know that an electrical signal passes from the top of the heart to the bottom of the heart as it is beating. The electrical signal is what is detected by the EKG monitor. Knowing that the electrical impulse passes from top to bottom, we can now dissect the parts of the EKG readings. The first bump is called a P wave. This correlates to the electrical signal passing through the atria, which are the top compartments of the heart. The signal then moves through the ventricles at the bottom of the heart creating the QRS complex and the T waves. In a dog that has a normal EKG reading, there should always be a P wave followed by a QRS complex followed by a T wave for each beat of the heart. And since the QRS complex creates the most distinct peak, the multi-parameter monitor actually counts the heart rate off of that QRS peak. It's really important to know that because then we know that we can only trust the heart rate if the shape of the EKG reading is appropriate. I've actually seen it sometimes where the T wave ends up being too high on the EKG reading and the monitor will actually perceive it as another peak and will count that in addition to the QRS complex. And then it essentially ends up double counting the heart rate. So it's always best to use a stethoscope to confirm that the heart rate on the monitor is actually matching what you're able to hear. I know I said that this dog has a normal EKG, but you may have noticed that like right there, we just got a group of QRST together and now we've got a spacing between them. Um, so that would actually be defined as an arrhythmia or an inconsistent heart rhythm. Um, but that's actually a normal thing in dogs, speci this specific type at least. Um, so if you can listen to the background and you hear this kind of like pumping sound, um, that's the ventilator causing her breaths, you'll notice that these clumps of the PQRST are all occurring right after that breath. Um, so this is what's called a respiratory arrhythmia. Sometimes when dogs are under anesthesia, um, they may go through a little bit of time where they're not taking, or their heart's not, not beating as they're taking the breath, but then it'll start beating again shortly after. Um, so in this case, you would actually not necessarily want to trust the heart rate that's being read by the multi-parameter meter because it's only taking that rate in short bursts of time 
Um, but instead, when you see this type of thing, you would want to actually listen to them with a stethoscope, count the beats longer because that's going to um, average out those bigger spaces between the beats with the shorter spaces. But this is a common thing that we see in anesthetized dogs. And since the P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave are all looking normal and it's timed with the breathing, we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I was worried because um, I didn't want to risk having the laser beam like accidentally get into the eye and cause damage to it. So I decided to just go with the scalpel blade. Yep, not worth risking it. Our EKG readings and the heart rate are staying consistent, so let's focus for a bit on the eyelid mass because I almost have it removed. Once I'm done removing the growth, we'll get back to our EKG discussion. This one has a pretty decent size mass too, so I had to take a um, bigger piece out. Yeah. This is what was on the outside there. So she's got like that little bit there. Some mm -hmm. of it came off in my forceps. And then if I turn it under, this was actually the inside of the eyelid. So she has that whole growth there that was actually oh, wow. in contact with her cornea. Um, so if I don't get all of that, it's still gonna be causing the friction on the cornea. So. Very satisfying. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Eyelid masses are rewarding to do. Right, now it looks like my margins are pretty good. Put that back up there. Alright, All right, now tiny, tiny suture to close it up so it doesn't cause irritation. Actually, this is not the right suture it's holder. Yes, it's dissolvable, um, and it's so it's a braided absorbable suture, polysorb. Um, very small size, six out, so you wouldn't usually see me doing that in the other surgeries. <laughs> um, braided, so I can get better knot security on it. Um, but yeah, it's very, very small. But because it's so small and delicate, I have a different type of needle driver. Oh my god, we have way too much stuff in this pack. <laughs> I don't need most of this. I was just playing with those earlier. Where did I put this? Ah, here. So see, the, the needle driver that we use for the eyelids, it's much more delicate. Oh. And it clips and opens. But like this needle is so tiny, like I don't want to bend it by using one of the other ones. We really need like a delicate approach with it. Because um, the other thing, everything we do with the eyelid, we need to make sure that we cause minimal irritation because mm -hmm. um, I want it to do a nice clean closure. So super teensy. Very cool. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Yeah. Right. I'm going to loosen this up so I can close my edges. Now it's going to bleed. So she's, you know, she might not look exactly normal because I am, um, took out part of that. Right there. Okay. But better than having a Very true. To use this sometimes to help protect the eye when I suture. So while I'm suturing, let's talk about how the heart actually works as a pump and how that generates our EKG readings. So first let's look at the anatomy. When the heart pumps, the top portion of the heart contracts together. So left atrium and right atrium, which collectively we call the atria, and then the bottom of the heart, left ventricle, right ventricle, collectively ventricles, those are gonna contract together. 
but looking at it through the perspective of a single blood cell, that blood cell is gonna enter from the body, it's gonna come down into the relaxed right atrium. That atrium is then gonna contract, pushing the blood down into the right ventricle. The right ventricle then contracts, pushing that blood out into the lungs. From there, the blood is gonna pick up oxygen. That oxygenated blood is then gonna re-enter the heart, but this time on the left side. It's gonna enter into the left atrium, which is then gonna contract, pushing the blood down into the left ventricle. The left ventricle is then gonna contract, pushing the blood out through to the rest of the body. Now, when this happens, both left and right atria, those contract together. That's gonna be when we see our P wave. Then, left and right ventricle are gonna contract together, and that's when we see our QRS complex. And then the ventricles are gonna relax, and that's when we see our T wave. But this is a mechanical system, and this is an electrical reading. So there has to be an electrical component of that too in order to actually generate this. And there is, the heart has its own electrical system, and that's actually how it tells the cells when to contract. So in a normal resting state, the cardiac cells have a negative charge, but there's positive particles, specifically sodium, potassium, calcium, and those positive particles enter the cardiac cell, shifting the charge to an overall positive state. That positive state is what tells the muscle cell that it needs to contract. So when the cell is positive, it contracts. And that shift to the positive charge is what causes our P wave. Now the charge then moves down through to the ventricles, the cardiac cells in the region of the ventricles, those become positive and contract. So that positive charge change creates the QRS complex. But the QRS complex is way bigger than the P wave, even though it's the same kind of transformation to a positive state. And that's because of the mass. So the ventricle aspect of the heart is much more massive than the atria. So because there's more muscle mass down here, there's more change in charge. This is a measure in the change in charge. So more change in charge is gonna give us a bigger peak. So that's why the QRS is so much bigger than the P wave, which is associated with the smaller atria. Now we have another change in charge though too. So after the ventricles have that positive charge, it then needs to relax and return to its normal state. So as muscles are relaxing, they lose that positive charge and they are gonna to return to their normal negative charge state. And that shift in charge is what gives us our T wave. So the heart is both a mechanical system, but also an electrical system. The EKG is not giving us a reading based on the pump of the heart. It's giving us the reading based on the electrical change of the heart. And that electrical change is what's signaling the heart to pump. So this is just a measure of the electricity. So now we can see how the heart is actually able to work as a pump both mechanically and electrically, and then that generates our EKG readings. And now it's comments time. So I was asked by a couple of people about incision length, and there's benefits of doing a longer incision as well as benefits of doing a shorter incision. So in terms of the spay surgery, for example, a longer incision is gonna allow you to better see what's in the abdominal cavity. So you can assess the internal organs, you can get better visualization of the ovaries and the uterus. But the downside is that you do have to keep the pet anesthetized longer. It takes longer to make the longer incision and it takes longer to suture it closed. The short incision, on the other hand, it doesn't allow you quite the same visualization of the abdominal cavity, but it's quicker to make that incision and quicker to suture it closed. So if you have a patient that's maybe not doing as well under anesthesia, I would go with the shorter incision approach. But if I have a patient that's very stable, then I'm gonna go for added visualization and do the longer incision. But I think the real concern here when people ask about incision length is that a lot of times we think that, oh, the incision's longer, that must mean it takes longer to recover, longer to heal, but that's actually not true. When it comes to healing, the amount of time that it takes for a wound to heal, it's not dependent on the length of the wound, it's actually dependent on the distance between the skin edges. So if I have an incision in the middle of my hands here, um, we'll take the spay incision for example, at the end of the surgery I suture those edges to close and they're very tightly adhered. So that's gonna heal fastest because the edges are together. But if I were to have like a large mass removal, for example, or a trauma case where there's not much tissue to deal with, 
Because of tension, I might not actually be able to suture those incision edges together and there can be a gap between the skin and that's gonna take longer to heal. So incision length does not affect healing time, but the distance between the skin edges does. So when we're assessing an incision, we more so wanna look at how those skin edges are aligned. The surface layer of the skin is called the epidermis, followed by the dermis, which is where the hair follicles are, and then below that is gonna be the subcutaneous layer. What we're really looking for is good apposition of those skin layers. We want epidermis to, derm to epidermis, dermis to dermis, subcutaneous to subcutaneous. You should see a nice flat surface on the top if they're lined up appropriately. We don't want any like bunching or gapping. We don't want any spacing. But as long as those edges are brought together very nicely and lined up anatomically appropriate, the incision length is not gonna affect wound healing time. Now I'd like to answer another question that I got. This one was in terms of cat neutering and it's a two part question. So part one, do I block the testes in a cat? And part two, is the glue necessary or is it okay to allow the incision to heal by second intention? So I wanna address the second part of that first actually because it directly ties into what we just talked about with wound healing. So first, second intention is when the skin edges are not brought tightly together. Um, so remember I said that you know the wound healing is dependent on how close those edges are aligned. Well, when they're allowed to be separated and not sutured together, that's what's called second intention healing. And that's usually what we do for cat neuters. So when I do a little bit of glue, it's actually just to bring those edges a little bit closer because the farther they are, the longer it's gonna take to heal but it will heal without the glue. I just choose to do it because it brings it a little bit closer, but is it absolutely necessary? Probably not. Um, now the second part of that is gonna be, do I block the testicles in a cat? And that really comes down to the why would we do that? Um, yes, I do, because I use it for pain control. So the main purpose of blocking the testes or putting a, a nerve block into the testicle is to prevent the pain response when I'm removing that testicle. I don't have to do a nerve block. I choose to because it's pretty easy to do and I know it's reliable, so I like that as part of my pain procedure, but that's not the only way to prevent pain. There's other medications that can be used as well. It just depends on what works with your pain protocol. But personally, yes, I do block the testicles of the cat. Thanks for all of the questions. It's a great way to bring up topics that I maybe hadn't thought about or that other people were wondering about as well. That way we can all continue to learn together. If you're thinking it, someone else is probably thinking about it too. So this episode we focused on the EKG readings and last time we talked about blood pressure. We're starting to get a better feel for the actual surgery room. So if you haven't checked it out yet, I recommend checking out the blood pressure monitoring episode as I'll assume moving forward that you understand these concepts. At this point, you should be able to look at the vital signs monitor and determine if the pet has a normal heart rate and rhythm as well as blood pressure. Now next episode, we can shift our focus a little bit. We can talk about the pre-surgical evaluation as well as the actual procedure while I do a leg amputation on a cat. And I'll also show you what to do if the vital signs monitor isn't working. And that's all for today. And thanks for watching. Let's continue to learn together. I'm Dr. Megs, and this is Everyday Vet.